Good evening, everybody. This is Dr. Palacios, and I am here to bring you another video. And in this case, we're going to be presenting about mental health and how to take care of it. So please, if you have a notebook with you and you wanna take notes, this is gonna be the right time to do so. So let's get right into it. And I look forward to working together, everybody. So here is the presentation, taking care of your mental health. So we're gonna go over a few things here that will be very helpful to our audience, whether you have been diagnosed with a mental illness or you just wanna have a good prevention on mental health. This, is this video is for you. So first thing we're gonna take a look at is a quick a fun fact where it says that people do not seek treatment for mental illness because of the associated stigma. Now keep in mind that stigmatization is a major component of discouragement, people going. Notice the difference when you say, oh, I'm gonna go see my psychiatrist because I've been feeling down versus I'm gonna go see my doctor because I fell and broke my leg. Now, which one would you likely be saying, oh yeah, of course you need to go see the doctor. Whereas the other one is like, wait, why would you go see your psychiatrist if you're feeling down? Like even just with that sentence, we can see the reaction difference and that already creates a form of judgment from our side as a society that we should take a look into ourselves more and change that habit and that perspective. Because of this, 44% of adults get diagnosed with mental illnesses that receive treatment. The rest, we don't know what happens to them. So to get into the learning objectives, what we're going to be doing today is mental health myths. I'm just going to go over a few of those. I'm going to talk about naturopathic philosophy. And then we're going to do techniques to keep your mental health intact and even prevent some illnesses in the future. So this includes meditation, obviously, then something we call conscious movement and it's gonna be related to Qigong, which is a form of Chinese medicine practice and conscious speech, which is gonna be related to biofeedback. So those three techniques are gonna go over here. And then we're gonna look about seeking help what are some things you should know about seeking help when it comes to mental illness? And finally, how do you tell your story? So it's a story of success and encouragement, not just for you, but for everyone listening to you. So this is where we're gonna get started. But before we get started, I just wanna share a little bit about myself. I am a licensed anthropathic physician in the state of Connecticut. I carry an online consultation online through my website, which you will see later. Or uh, if you want to come and see me, I am working right now in Lancaster downtown in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. I have a certification in cranial psychotherapy for all three levels. And my specialty is in headaches and migraines, men's health, and better quality of life. So please feel free to reach out if you have any questions regarding this specific uh, aspects. So mental health myths. Is it, are you mentally ill if you just have a bad day or you just have a couple days where you're feeling down? Well, not really because mental illness tends to go where it's a chronic episode. So we're going to take some myths, some things that are not true. So for example, if you have a mental illness, it means that you should, you do not, you cannot hold a job. And that we know that to be false. Only happens to weak characters. Now, what does it mean by weak characters? Well, we will think in societal terms, weak characters, people who are introverted, people who don't say much, people who tend to just be secluded and excluded from society. Um, basically people who don't tend to be on the top of the food chain. And by, what I mean by that is businesses, but that is not true. Even the most successful humans out there are, tend to have a lot of problems with mental illness. You can see that with musicians. You can see that with 
artists and even some CEOs. Um, there is no hope. Obviously, that is false. There's lots of hope, whether your mental illness is it a is it a risk stage or not so much. Therapy is a waste of time. Again, big, big misconception because of the stigma, we think that's the case. Pills will fix all. So remember, the medicines that the psychiatrist can give you for your mental illness are just to help you cope. They're not the solution. You have to go to therapy and you have to do what the professional is telling you to do. You have to do your best. And then finally, there is no prevention. And this is where I'm going to break that myth quite a lot because as a naturopathic physician, as a naturopathic carrying the naturopathic philosophy, prevention is everything. So once again, let's just highlight those and move on to the next page. So healthy mind. So what is a healthy mind? Well, it is more of a philosophical question because we, every one of us are healthy in different ways. Like our bodies are healthy. We know when we're healthy, but when it comes to the mind, for some it's healthy, but for others it's not. So I'm gonna just show you some basic examples. So I like this little meme from Parks and, Recre Parks and Rec. Do you have any history of mental illness in your family? I have an uncle who does yoga. Now, for him, yes, it is a mental illness to do yoga, but for the uncle who does yoga, it is prevention to his mental illness. And then that's, many of us can relate to this. We're gonna try our best to put our happy face for the day that lies ahead because our work, our relationships require us to carry a happy face. Now, the healthy mind obviously has to come with you, within you. You have to be honest with how you're standing, how you're feeling, because no one can tell whether your mind is healthy or not. I may not exactly answer what is a healthy mind, because again, I'm gonna get into the philosophy part now. So we're gonna take a look at the aspects of the being. So not just the body per se, or the mind per se, or the spirit per se, but all three of them, because mental health is related and correlated with body and spirit. If one of these are not healthy, the mind is very difficult for the mind to also be healthy. So I wanna just bring this up because if you wanna have a healthy mind, you also need to consider how is your body and how is your spirit doing. Now. The spirit, obviously that is a very ambiguous word. So I'm gonna go here and work with the etymology of the spirit. Remember, etymology means the root word of spirit. And you may be surprised that spirit, the root word comes from the spear component, S-P-I-R. That is actually coming from Sanskrit, which, is, which kind of strengthens the theory that uh, Indo-European languages have a connection all together, what we call Proto-Indo-European languages. So the spirit, what is the spirit in Sanskrit? It means breath. So this is where we get the words for respiration, inspiration, and inspire. Maybe there are other words that have spear in other languages, and that's related to that. So spirit, in this sense, we're gonna be focusing on the breath. Okay, so it's breath, body, mind. Well, now the body. What is the body? What is the soul? I'm bringing the soul here because I believe the soul is closer related to the body than the spirit. And the reason is because of two etymologies that I found. One is where it says quick moving. That is the etymology of soul from the old German, which I believe is Sawell or something like that. And then the other etymology for the other Western languages, which comes from uh, the Latin root anima. And anima comes from, uh, obviously we get those words for animal, animation, animate, giving soul to the body, giving connections and movement, something that allows the body 
to be alive. And we know when the body is alive versus a cadaver, which is a body without any life. Something is missing. We can explain what that is, but I think that's what I call the soul. So that's what we're going to be focusing here. The spirit is the breath. The soul is what holds the body together from birth to death. And then the mind, this is another one because in the different philosophies and religions, we have two separate views, actually plenty of views. And I just wanna make some distinctions here. So first we have the word yi in Chinese and the word xin in Chinese. So these are two kinds of words that they use for, for mind. So the first one that you see on the top this is what we get from Sanskrit as manos or mens. And that means the mind that we use in the West. So this is your intellect, your thought, your memory, your ability to rationalize, make ideas, and, you know, just like we call in the West, the, the process of mental, um, mental work and psychology. Now, in the East, they also use mind as the heart, the emotional heart, which in the West, we just say a heartbreak. In the East, when you say a heartbreak, many times they, they mean a mind break or a mind being injured, the mind getting injured. So it's a cultural difference, but I wanted to bring it up because I'm trying to be as integrative and as universal as possible with this aspect of mental health. So we have two kinds of minds and I want you to consider that when I talk about the mind, I don't just talk about mental health from the intellect part, but I also mean it from the heart part. And we can see that nowadays because there is a connection of mental illness with our body having the conditions. One of them, it, I believe it's called Sukuyomi. If you guys can please fix that or correct me for that. And that's what we call uh, octopus heart, which happens to broken heart syndrome. Broken heart syndrome is when you have a terrible experience with somebody that you love very much dying and your heart gets weak because literally your heart is broken. And we see in the heart chambers, the anatomical heart, that there is a rupture, there is a cavity, an extra cavity that suggests injury to the walls of the heart. So this is a great example of how the mind and the body are related. And then the spirit obviously is the way for us to relate them to each other. So let's move on now to the mind in mental health. Now let's define the mind here. So the intellect, our ability to analyze, rationalize and organize ideas. And I'm gonna create just a quick map here. So how the mind affects our behavior. So we can go with whatever comes, whatever thought you're having, then you entertain the thought. Let's say, oh, I wanna get this new car. Okay, you're entertaining the thought. Perhaps you saw it from a TV commercial, a magazine, or somebody talked to you about it. Then there is a feeling saying, oh, I feel that I need the car, that you're going to rationalize your desire. And then it goes into an emotion. The emotion is now a little stronger because now your body is reacting a little more. And then there's the willpower as our underliner here. The willpower is now the intention, the intention is now created and you are ready to look into your bank account, see how you're gonna be paying for the car. And at the end, use the voluntary muscles to drive yourself up there or have somebody drive yourself to the dealer so you can get the car. And finally, the action is the actual purchase of the car and the effect is you enjoying the car and paying the debt that what, however much you pay for that. So as you can see, the cause is all of this from thought, feeling, emotion, willpower, voluntary muscles and actions. That is the cause of the mind, how the mind influences you to create an action and therefore 
have an effect. And once the effect is out, out there, then that's it. There's no turning back. However, there are things that we need to be careful, we need to be watchful for because there are things that we can do right and wrong. And this comes from willpower and action. So willpower, obviously I use an example of the car, but say you are in, a, in an argument, whether it can turn physical or argumentative, if you are carrying the willpower and the intention to cause harm, that's gonna happen. The voluntary muscles are just gonna follow you. Now, voluntary muscles also means the voice, saying the wrong things, saying the evil things. Because the larynx, this are muscles, your voice box are, um, they are made of muscles and yeah, so basically it's muscles. So it includes everything. Um, so willpower and action, that's what you gotta be careful where you're putting good intentions or bad intentions. But if you wanna be more proactive, which is gonna help us a lot for our mental health, is our willpower. This is the real thing that we can control before it becomes an action, which is gonna lead to an effect. We can revert, we can turn back the cascade by stopping our will, our willpower and then go back to the emotion, the feeling and the thought. So the techniques that we're gonna be doing today will help us just skip in that intentional mode and then bring it back until we can just go even beyond thought, before thought. And what is there before thought? Well, that is your true mind to show you. So uh, some examples of the willpower include, you know, diet. This is something we can see a lot. People, um, some people like to have the magic pill to lose weight, to have a healthy lifestyle, but there is no such thing as that. The real ingredient is willpower. And then this cute little dog trying to keep the hot dog balance without reacting. That is another form of willpower. Now, obviously the dog is probably looking at the owner because the owner is training him to do that. But as a human, remember, we have free will to do so. So we have the free will to use the willpower for good or bad. Now, Naturopathic care on mental health. First, I just want to say, I just want to show you what are some principles that I, I want to share with you and steps that are going to help you keep your mind healthy. Some preventions that you can do. So first of all, protect your mind. Now, this obviously may not make much more sense at the moment, but as we go through the presentation, it'll make It'll make sense as to what I mean by protecting the mind, but let's, let me put you a scenario. So protecting your mind is making sure that you're not getting hurt by people who you think are going to benefit you. So I believe there was a quote from the Buddha who said, it is better to be wounded by a wild animal than to be hurt by an insincere friend because the wound that an unsincere friend can do to you, it's much deeper than a wound and a wild animal can do on your body. The body can heal and it has a process of healing, but when the scar goes into the mind and the heart, that, is, that takes a lot longer to heal. So that's, that's one scenario of how to protect your mind. The next thing is to know thyself. This is from our famous Socrates, who continue to inquire the, the youth. Know yourself. Who are you? What are you? So in this case, what are your thoughts? What are your feelings? Know yourself. Know what triggers you. Know what makes you happy. Know what makes your mind uh, react. All of that is a process, a learning process, but the more awareness you integrate, the easier it becomes for you. Next is to analyze your cravings. Just like we mentioned about the car, 
sometimes it's important to just know what is it that you want and what is it that you need. And if there are things that you need, notice if it's really what you need. There are things that we take for granted, actually a lot of things that we take for granted because of our comfort nowadays that we live in a society where everything is protected. We don't have to worry about sleeping outside anymore, worrying about wild animals hunting us. We don't have to worry about that. But on the other hand, we do have to worry about getting our job done, getting, uh, paying bills and all of that. So make sure you analyze your deep desires and see if they're really worth having. Next is to accept your surroundings. So this is your environment. Where are you exactly? Is the city fit where you are or the countryside, wherever you are? Do you feel accepted by the people? Do you feel that you have a good social group? And if you don't, perhaps you might consider another change of scenery. And you can travel for that as well. And then the last two is to be with the right people, which again kind of goes back to protecting the mind and being with more sincere people. And they don't have to be friends or family per se. It's just people who are sincere with you and they are there for you. And then number six is doing the right thing. Now, doing the right thing is very obvious, uh, something that we learn in elementary school. But it is important to keep that in mind because it is the morality aspect. If we have ethics and morals that we stay true to our principles and our core values, and that speaks very highly of us in our discipline and in our own spiritual growth. Okay. So this is more of a commitment of, to yourself. All of this is a commitment to yourself, which will help prevent mental illnesses. Now, let's go into the right meditation. This is our first technique. So first, I'd like you to find a comfortable spot. So if you want to sit on a cushion, please feel free to do so on a lotus side, as you see, cross-legged. Or if you if you prefer, you can also do it on a chair. Now, the main thing here is to not lean your back on the chair. So first, find a comfortable chair or sitting. Make sure your back is not leaning against anything. And here we're going to inhale and exhale consciously. So I want you to, at this point, close your eyes and inhale and exhale, breathe in and out. Now those are, that was just three cycles. We're gonna do a few more here. So as you inhale, I want you to count in your mind or using your fingers to five. And as you exhale, also count to five. And we are, this is going to help us maintain the harmony between inhale and exhale. So I'm going to be putting my hands like this and I'm going to breathe in. Maybe you'll hear it from my microphone. So. And let's do one more. So the purpose of inhaling and exhaling in the same rhythm is, like I said, to bring harmony, not just to your body, but also to your spirit. Remember what I mentioned, what the spirit is. The spirit is the breath. And if you have in harmony the breath within you, that's going to create harmony in your body, in your soul, which is going to also communicate it to your mind, which the intellectual mind and the emotional mind. So 
if it helps as you do this for 10 minutes. Uh, I'd like you to just play some kind of music and you know, try this for 10 minutes and you're gonna have thoughts, things are gonna come in, feelings are gonna arise. And what I want you to do is to just picture those as clouds, just clouds going through your mind's eyes. They just come in and they go out. Very similar to a movie theater. Like you're, you're watching the movie, there's the big screen and then you see somebody walking uh, with their in their shadow saying, okay, I gotta go to the bathroom. Okay, he's walking. So that kind of shadow is not part of your mind. That shadow is like a thought, the feelings, emotions that arise. So let them be there. Don't stop them. Just let them walk away on their own. If you're feeling strong about those sensations, just bring your focus more on the breath. Remember, the mind has a strong power and the more refined your focus is, the stronger your awareness is going to be. So please try this on your own for 10 minutes and you'll notice some nice benefits once you balance the spirit. Now this next technique is called Qigong. Like I mentioned, this is a form of Chinese movement exercise, which is similar to Tai Chi. Qigong works with the breath as well, and it's more corporeal. It uses your body more, very similar to yoga. So yoga will be like the Indian method, and then Qigong, Tai Chi would be the, the Chinese method. Whichever way you want to use, it's, it works fine with me, as long as the focus is the breath. So I just briefly want to play this scene on the first exercise. So two hands up holding the sky. And what I really like about this video is the instructions are clear and the movements are quite clear. So yeah, as she's bringing her arms up, you're breathing in and then exhale. And then breathe in again. And exhale. One more time. Hands together. Breathe in. And that's it. So I just wanted to show you this simple technique. There are, I believe there are eight different practices that you can try in this particular video. And I highly recommend you to try it. It's very practical, it's very simple, and that's a really great way to start your day or even end your day. Really, really recommend it. So moving on to our next technique. This is what I call adapting with speech. So this is regarding biofeedback. So biofeedback, how it works, and I'll show you the steps here. First is what I want you to do is find your sternum, well, your manubrium, which is the top part of your chest bone. Now, here's a picture of where the, the chest bone is. Now, remember, you have what this, this little gap here this little uh, indentation, and that's called the suprasternal notch. Now you don't wanna press over there because that has very important organs and you could kind of choke yourself with that. But you wanna, what you wanna do is tap and touch that little area that I put in green, that little circle, 
And I want you to put your hands in this position, like a little flower almost, with your fingers like this. And you're going to go there, and you're gently going to tap there. Just gently tap. So this is the biofeedback technique. Find a trigger that causes you discomfort or uncomfort. Now, this is obviously a, a technique that you use when you're emotionally disturbed, emotionally unstable, or there is just something that you're, you're very stressed about. You can't ground yourself. So the idea now is to re-experience that. So think of a time where maybe your boss got upset at you or your spouse made you really upset or a friend was very insincere to you or some or a time when you were lied to. Now, those feelings of anger or pain or sadness may arise. And that's when you gotta find yourself, ground yourself. And when, as you're tapping on the chest bone, you're saying these three phrases. I am at peace. I am breathing, I can handle the situation. And then you just repeat it as many times as you need it. I am at peace, I am breathing, I can handle the situation. I am at peace, I am breathing, I can handle the situation. So, as I mentioned, repeat it as needed. Don't forget to breathe. Yes, you're tapping, but your awareness to the breath should not go anywhere. And if you can maintain your breathing in a harmonious way, like I said, it's gonna help your spirit. And then continue until your emotions are subsided. You'll notice that the distraction will help. Your willpower will, be, will turn back and you will not create an effect that it's unwanted. So, this is the idea. The biofeedback technique is using speech. So you can go back from willpower down to emotion and just thought to the point that it doesn't interfere with your mental activity anymore. Now, this is a technique of the body. As we notice, we are trying to distract the mind, the emotional mind and the intellectual mind from taking its course because our hands are very close to our mind. So our minds and our hands work very closely. So if we can like close our hands and tap, that's gonna distract us. It's gonna distract the mind. So it's gonna be able, it's gonna help us return it back. Okay, I think I said that multiple times. So I, I hope it's being very clear. Now I have a few words on seeking help. Moving on to the next thing. I hope the techniques were helpful to you and please try them out. Now, when it comes to seeking help, uh, obviously you can have your dog to be your therapist because he'll always listen to you or she. But here are the things to keep in mind. Professional help is very different from non-professional help, which we can also call uh, comfort help. So professional help, you they're going to work with you because they're going to take your case, they're going to learn about you. And you also have to be patient because when it comes to mental health, you don't know exactly the problem and the psychologist, the psychiatrist or therapist may not also be with that, may, may not also understand that. So. Let's take a, just a list here. So counselors, therapists, if you're curious about the difference, counselor just takes your case a little short term and therapists tend to take your case a little long term. And that kind of goes with whether you have a good match with your counselor or therapist. And that's important too. If you have a match with your therapist, all the better. If you don't have a match, you could consider another therapist and see what other options you have available because you are sharing very deep things about you. Uh, then there is the psychiatrist. And like I've mentioned, they have a medical degree. So they are able to administer psychiatric medications. So they can give you psychiatric medications and 
in addition to therapy. Now, religions and spiritual groups, although they are not professionals per se, they are there for the social support. And I think it's very important to, you know, be honest about some of the struggles that you're going through. And the nice thing about the religious and spiritual groups is that you, you all have a purpose, you all join for a purpose, and ideally it is for the greater good. You know, you want everybody to be on the same page, everybody to be healthy. So it is a nice little group to be with. And then, like I mentioned, all of the above, you could have all of them. If, if the time allows you, if you need the help, try it as much as you can. Um, and then, like I mentioned, do not seek professional help from this. This can help you for comfort, but you should not take professional advice from them. So Google and social media. We see a lot of those. We're getting the news now for social media, but as funny as they may be, as true as they may seem to be, this is not professional advice, okay? Even if doctors make memes, still, they, sh they know that it's not professional advice, so you should not take it as professional advice. Uh, the other one is cults. Now, the difference between cults and religious groups is, well, religious groups tend to be a very organized, a big religion that most of us would know. Cults tend to just be based on a small group. They tend to be secluded and they tend to isolate themselves from the other spiritual groups. And the, and the thing that works, the tricky part to say is that cults don't work for the greater good. Like they don't have a set principle or core ethics in them. So that's going to hurt you a lot if you do catch yourself with that. And that can also not just go with the religious, but also businesses. So please be careful with that. Uh, friends, workmates, spouse, and family. Now, yes, they can help you, comfort you. They can, you can go and tell your problems to them so they can comfort you. But because they know you, um, they might want to give you advice. They might say, hey, try this or do this. But remember, it's up to you at the end of the day. And they are not professionals either. Even if your spouse is a professional psychiatrist, um, that relationship is different. I personally don't believe that your spouse should be your doctor. Uh, everybody has a different perspective and opinion on that. It's because I believe we just need to keep the relationships separate. So, all right, everybody. So here I wanna share the last thing that I have for today is how to share your story with others. So this is something that doesn't mean that you're overcome and you're over the mental illness. It just means that you're at a spot where you have hope and you can continue to work towards betterment, improvement. So for telling your story, these are the questions that I'd like you to answer. One, what happened to you? Okay, so what is really, what was the problem? Two, who helped you? Three, what mistakes did you do? Now, this isn't a form of self-criticism or to make you feel bad, but it's in a way to understand that there are things that happen where you probably made a mistake and maybe now you you think to and say to yourself, okay, maybe I don't, maybe I won't do it again. Now I know that I won't do that part again. So that's what it means. Four, how did you overcome the pain? Because again, going with mental illness, there is a lot of uh, heart, heart, well, emotional pain. So with that, how did you overcome that? Have you been able to overcome it? And I'm sure from the very beginning to this point, you are at a better place. So that's what I want you to think. How have you been overcoming that? And then number five, how were you transformed? Now, transformation is a big word here because it's not the mistakes that you learn, it's rather 
how are you different as a person now versus as a person when this event happened? When you first got your mental illness versus now, how are you different of a person? So once you know that, you'll be able to share the morale of the story. Now the morale is the audience. What do you want the audience to learn? What do you want the audience to get out of your story? So there is hope, there is growth, and there is happiness at the end of your story. And it also helps us create the story a little bit better. So it looks like how it is in our heads versus how we try to write it down. So last, last thing, <laughs> really, this is really the last thing. Uh, simple questions to ponder every night. So keep in mind that gratitude is the best attitude. So first question, did you, did you laugh today? Did you have a good laugh? A good belly laugh. Not just a chuckle, but an actual laugh. Then number two is how can my mind become more focused during my activities? How can you do less multitasking and more focused work? Multitasking is not something the mind wants to be trained to do. You can train it for your everyday life, for work, but on your own, on your time alone, you want to keep away from that. Number three, how can I nourish my body with healthy food choices? Now, how, what does this have to do with a healthy mind? Well, remember, mind, spirit, body, the body, the soul, they need to have good nourishment. And that only can come from healthy food choices. Number four. Can I let the flow of existence take its course? In other words, can I let things be? There are a million and one things that I cannot control. Can I just let it be? And can I be okay with what I can control? That's the, that's the question. Uh, if you want to look at it from a more religious, perhaps Christian perspective would be, how can I let God do with me what he needs to do for me. So how can I let him take charge of my life? Again, letting, letting the higher being do the work through you. Number five, have I made someone smile today? And again, this is as simple as going outside, walking, and just saying hi to the person walking towards you. If you're shy, at least you can talk to a friend, send them a message, send them something funny that makes them laugh. And then the last one is, have I genuinely thanked my body today? And this is a great practice when you wake up and you go to sleep because it keeps the attitude of gratitude present. Now, if you believe that your body is betraying you because you're in pain or your mental health is not in best condition, it's okay. Just keep in mind that your body is doing its best to keep you alive and keep you having this experience of what we call human, human life. So that is all that I have with that little smile. Uh, if you guys have any questions regarding how to reach me, this is where you can find me with my email, my Instagram. I also have a Facebook and my website where you can download a free ebook on this site. And then there's tons of educational videos, blogs, and services. So, and the office that I'm currently working is in Generative Health in downtown Lancaster. So please feel free to come and visit. Give me a call if you wanna get more information on that. So last thing I wanna say is Teşekkür Ederim, which is thank you in Turkish. And again, there's a lot of other languages here. So thank you so much and have a great rest of your night.